So hello everyone out there in Facebook live land. This is really exciting. I'm bringing to you a, a, my, uh, a talk with a, a friend of mine in uh, the psychic world. Woo this is Bob Nygar, who I'll be introducing in a second. And uh, just a couple moments of uh, housekeeping. Make sure that you like us on Facebook and like us on YouTube so that you will be able to subscribe and get get updates every time I go live. And I have had so much fun doing all these fun conversations with people that are people I know in this world. And I have had some great conversations. So check them out on YouTube. Of course, it's also going to be up here on uh, Facebook Live. And I will be taking questions for Bob as we go, but keep, keep an eye out that I only can see like the last four comments as um, you guys are writing them on Facebook off on the screen over here on my right. I'm trying not to be rude and not looking at the camera, but I'm actually looking at another screen over here when I'm looking off to the side. I am not playing solitaire. <laughs> not much. Anyway, <laughs> so I'd like to introduce to you today, uh, Bob Nygaard, who I had met because he did a skepticality podcast with Derek Colin Duno many years ago. And I thought, this guy is so interesting. I need to know who this man is. He was talking to uh, Derek. And I believe that was the first time you actually heard of this skeptic world that we're, we're in and this, this world that you're now kind of enmeshed in. And then um, uh, Rob Palmer, who is one of my GSOW editors, very prolific and the well-known skeptic. He, he heard your interview also and said, oh, this guy's really interesting. I want to read his Wikipedia page. There was yeah. no Wikipedia page. And he said, I'm going to write a Wikipedia page for this guy. He needs a Wikipedia page. Bob is, um, Rob Palmer has done a lot of work on psychics and, and grief vampires, yeah. what we call them, on Wikipedia. He's one, one of those people who likes to write those, as well as others of mine. Right. I see lots of people joining. All right. So, Bob, tell us who you are. So I'm Bob Nygaard and I'm a, a retired police officer turned private investigator turned part-time actor. So <laughs> it's a long road. So in the long road, uh, you know, I started off as a cop back in 1985 in New York, back in uh, riding in subway trains in Harlem as a transit cop. And I had a 21-year career and then uh, retired from there and then went into uh, private investigation. I retired down to Florida. And uh, when I was down in Florida, I happened to pick up a uh, psychic case, a psychic fraud case um, in 2008. And uh, I took that case and I was able to help five women get back $65,000 and get the psychic arrested and convicted. And uh, so it turned out to be a big deal. It was in the papers and everything. And uh, next thing you know, people started calling me from all over the world, seeing that I had been successful, saying, hey, Bob, you know, I was ripped off by a psychic. Can you help me? You know, so... <laughs> Oh, it's been a this long journey. World, this world you're in. I mean, think about like 15 years ago. Would you ever think that you would be here in these this <laughs> living no, this life? You know, when I when I was a young cop, I, I never in my wildest dreams thought that it would ever lead me into this. You know, yeah. I started off. I, I had made an arrest back in 1991 of some guys that were known as travelers that were ripping off my elderly neighbor. And they went in on a scam where they said they were doing like they needed to do work for, they were from the water company and needed her to go in the basement and bang on the pipes and whatnot. And then they were doing, gonna burglarize her house. I was able to catch those five guys. And with that, that arrest was on like Eyewitness News Channel 7. And it was a big deal. And I got a call out of the blue from a guy by the name of John Grow, And he was with the sergeant in the Baltimore Police Department. And uh, he was in a burglary unit. And he said, Bob, this was such a great arrest. He says, I don't know if you realize. He goes, you know, we have a problem with these transient type criminals who are family-based organized crime. And what they're doing is like they're going out and they're moving around the country and we're not keeping up with them as law enforcement. We need to share information and trade pictures. So he started telling me about these travelers. And then the next thing you know, he started telling me about the families that do fortune telling and do uh, you know psychic fraud and do home improvement scams and do driveway repair coding scams and insurance fraud and sweetheart swindles of the elderly. And it became this whole world of con artists who were family based, but yet had an organization structure. 
And uh, so, you know, I got into, immersed into this whole world. And this man, John Grow, became my mentor. Started me sending me pictures of these people from all over the country. And uh, it wasn't, though, until I retired and I picked up that psychic case of Gina Marie Marks was the woman down in Florida. And uh, I was able to help a doctor get her money back and, and some other women. And it was that's when I started into the psychic stuff. Yeah. Oh, it's so interesting. I, I mean, I could listen to your stories all the all the time. We wrote the Wiki, the GSW project did write the Gina Marks Wikipedia page, which was so interesting. That whole that whole um, scam, the the idea of um, you know busting these people makes me just so excited. You know the the feeling that somebody's getting their comeuppance. You know, in this world we're living in right now, it feels like nobody's held accountable. And yep. and to to know that somebody's out there that's actually like busting these people, and I keep saying every time I I I, I see your name, I think. We need more Bob Nygars. <laughs> well, I'm an admirer of yours because I've watched the undercover work that you've done recently. Oh, thank you. And uh, I think it's phenomenal, you know, <laughs> going out there and exposing these people. And uh, I first started to learn about that when James Randi was doing it and uh, where he was catching them, you know, where they were talking on a microphone and he's getting information. You know, someone was getting information from their wife and, you know, about the audience members. And uh, so that, you know, was very interesting to me. And then in doing some research, I learned that Houdini back in the day was actually doing the same thing that I'm doing now, was he debunking psychics. And he was actually sending women in undercover and was uh, gathering evidence against them. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a big deal. And, you know, in the time of the pandemic now, uh, I'm getting swamped with calls from people because everybody's so fearful about what the future holds. And uh, the psychics are, are making a killing. They're making a fortune right now off of people that are vulnerable and fearful about what the future, you know, is going to bring. And um, so, so it's really a, a devastating time when you have a problem going on in the world and then you have predators out there preying upon it and using it to their advantage. Yeah. Absolutely. And I was wondering, I was going to ask you about that, if you thought it was more prevalent now. I mean, also, and what Mark Edward, my partner, Mark Edward, always says is that uh, psychics can be like a, a cheap person's therapy. You know, you got somebody to talk to. They want to talk to you about you. They're not interested in talking about themselves. They want to zoom in on you. And in a lot of ways, these people are really lonely. They're at home. They're, they're missing a lot of the social activities that they had before. And now, you know, for so much a minute or, you know, a reading, they can have somebody completely telling them, you know, all about themselves and all about the world around them and, and how they're found, you know, what, you know, this uncertainty in the world. I think that it's, I would think it's even more prevalent because, just people are lonely. Yeah, absolutely. No, people and people are fearful, you know, and uh, they prey upon that fear. These self-proclaimed psychics prey, prey upon that fear, mm -hmm. and um, you know, people are usually the victims of these self-proclaimed psychics. Are usually going through one of three problems: love, money, or health. There's <laughs> something going on in their life. That's the commonality in the victims. They could be of any age, any any background, but usually they're an experiencing problem. Their husband left them. Their wife left them. Uh, you know. They, a divorce, uh, a child that has autism, a diagnosis of cancer, you know, all of these different problems. They lost their job. Uh, you know, all of these different problems are going on and they go to the psychic and the self-proclaimed psychic says, oh, don't worry. I see a darkness. I see a negativity around you. I have to do some deeper research. They start them off with a nominal fee. Mm -hmm. And basically what it is, it's a crime where they're financially exploiting someone under the guise of offering them assistance. And they're telling them that, oh, don't worry, you know, I have the power and I can see into the future and I can correct this problem because God never meant for this problem to exist, you know. And who doesn't want, you know, hope and that they have a very powerful product and that's false hope. Yep. So, you know, they want us. I can cure you of the cancer. You know, I can cure your child of autism. You know, you can get a better job. You can get a job. You'll get a job. You know, your husband will come back to you. Your wife will come back to you. You know, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, you know, and they use a lot of the same psychological manipulation or principles that a cult leader uses. OK, but it's just one on one. Mm -hmm. So they create a sense of dependency. They isolate the victim from friends and family. 
They say, you can't talk about the work that we're going to do with anybody. It has to be between you, me, and God. And so, you know, the person is sworn to secrecy because they know they're dealing with a vulnerable person. And they know if that person goes and talks to someone else and says they're giving money to the psychic, that could thwart the scam. So right off the bat, swear them to secrecy. This is just between you and I. Can't tell anybody about the work. And then create a sense of dependency. You know, don't talk to anyone else. And I'm the only one you can trust. They create a siege mentality. If someone does happen to say, hey, you're acting strange, and they tell the psychic, the psychic says, oh, everybody's out to get us. That person is out to stop us from completing the work, the spiritual work that we're performing. So you can't trust them. So create a siege mentality. You know, we have all these psychological principles that roll right off their tongue. Uh, Exacerbate the victim's existing fears. Introduce new fears. Person's in an auto accident. Oh, that's because of the curse, you know? Person has something good happen. Oh, that's, you know, the boyfriend called, the husband called, the wife called. That's because of the work that I'm doing. That's why they texted you. That's why they called you. So they use all the things going on. If something good goes on in someone's life, they say that's because of the work we're doing. If something bad's going on, that's because of the curse, Mm -hmm. you know? Absolutely. So I've got a couple comments already that uh, I I should probably. Yeah, sure. As we go, because they come up. Um, April Colanduno said that she misses us at uh, Dragon Con and and she wishes we could go back and and go there. Um, And Derek Colanduno is talking about how how much he misses Dragon Con. And I know you were there uh, two years or I've been there two years. I gave lectures two years, and uh, yeah, I met you at. Uh, I met you there. I met you there. We had. I remember we went outside. We had a little talk, and it was great. <laughs> it was fun. The first time we had ever met pers- in person. One of my highlights oh, was, was sitting and talking to you for, and got a couple pictures. That's the photo that people will see on the top of the uh, event for this. Is us having a little confidential talk, even though there was people all around us. It was and really Derek nice. Is great. You know, Derek called me up, and he interested introduced me to the skepticality and had me on and that was the first time at dragon con where i had met derek in person as well and it was just a thrill you know to meet derek and and uh you know talk everything over with them it was great it was neat because you're a part of this world but you didn't know that you're a part of this world yeah, so we I did you it. into it we're like wait a minute it. you're us you're part yeah. of our team get over here yeah i didn't realize there was all these like-minded people out there you know and uh, and it was really uh, comforting and, and a thrill to be part of that. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Paula had uh, mentioned something that I think is real important, too. And I mean, I can do these psychic stings. I've got more planned that I could easily do. The thing is, the problem is, is I don't want to do them unless I have some media that is going to get the story out there farther than just me writing an article for Skeptical Inquirer. I need to get outside of the community. And she says people like Johnny Carson um, that really helped uh, the James Randi, Peter Popoff thing you were talking about. And we need a lot more media to step up and say, I'm on your guys' team. Let's get this story out there and get it big, you know? And I think that that's something that's really missing. I know that you did a a show called um, Pink Collar Crimes. Yeah, uh, it was you've been doing some other things too, as well. Yeah, the, the, it was episode season one, episode three, and it was called "The Psychic Didn't See Him Coming," and it was about my pursuit of Gina Marie Marks and how I had caused her to be arrested like three times over the course of like ten years. First time I helped women get back sixty-five thousand and had her convicted, and she just got probation. Then the second time I had Gina Marie Marks uh, investigated her, and it was on behalf of three victims. I helped them get back $503,000 and she was sentenced to 18 months in a Florida state prison. And then the third time I got Gina Marie Marks investigated her and caused her to be arrested was in Maryland. The first two times were in Florida. The last time was in Maryland and it was on behalf of a few women uh, and the victims were out somewhere in the vicinity of like $340,000 and helped the victims get some of their money back and she got sentenced to prison in Maryland and where I believe she might be. I'm not sure if she's out yet or not. Wow, wow, wow. So but that um, was the media, using the media to smoke. You know, uh, ABC, I've done some shows for 2020, uh, and I did a show on uh, Warner Brothers with Crime Watch Daily. I did a show for them. Um, I did Dr. Oz, uh, you know, like a bunch of things where I'm trying to get out into the media and show how 
uh, you know, that when you see that little fortune telling parlor, it often hides a sinister side, mm -hmm. you know? And I'm trying to educate people so that they don't become victims. They don't get emotionally abused and financially decimated by these heartless con artists. And, um, you know, like you call them, I've heard you say grief vampires, you know? Um, there, was, there was one case and, and a woman was ripped off for $17 million approximately. She was a best-selling author by the name of Jude Devereaux. And uh, her, her little boy had died in a, in a tragic ATV accident. I think he was maybe eight years old. And um, the psychic said, oh, you know, she could see the little boy getting pulled into the flames of purgatory, basically something to that effect. And, uh, you know, this woman was willing to give any amount of money to, to have her son, you know, go to heaven and, 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 you know, be okay, you know, and not be in the flames right. of purgatory, you know? I mean, you know, to prey upon a grieving mother who lost her child, I mean, that's I don't know of too many things more despicable than that. That you know? is definitely a grief vampire. Yeah, and Rose Marks was the was the woman, and she got convicted at, in federal court, and she was sentenced. To, I believe it was ten years. Now, so. Going to talking about the police, this I found really interesting, and I I heard you talking about this with Derek Colin Duna on skepticality, and also you've talked about it with Rob Palmer in some of the articles he's written about you. Is this you were police, and this interaction between them i guess you're i don't know if it's improving or not but it, what would happen is you would approach the police and say this person has been conned and some of the time you're hearing from the police saying well i should have known better well the uh, you know it's very common if a victim tries to go in on their own my experience is, is that they're just shown the door and they're told hey listen it's a civil matter it's not a crime you willingly gave your money which which really ticks me off oh my way. gosh yeah, and it ticks me up to no end because I was a cop and I respect the profession and I don't like when people go in and get that type of uh, misinformation. You know, they're met with laughter, misreporting and ignorance. And that just shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the thing is, is that it's not common. You know, a cop could go his whole career and never have someone come in and say I was ripped off by a psychic or a detective could never do a case or a prosecutor. So people just generally don't want to do something that they've never done before that makes them uncomfortable. But, you know, that's not appropriate when you're dealing with a person who can only go to the police to get the arrest made. It's not like Giuseppe's Pizza Parlor. You go there, you don't like the service or the pizza. You could go down the block to Joe's and get a slice down there. No, if you're the victim of a crime and it's in a certain precinct or a certain, you know, a jurisdiction, you're stuck with whoever is in that jurisdiction. So when people get turned away by police and prosecutors, they're really... Uh, you know, the police or prosecutor that turned that victim away is really doing a disservice to that victim. I mean, they'll never get justice because of that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the ignorance of it, when, when they say the victim will call me up, I say, well, what did the police say? And they said, oh, they said, it, you know, I willingly gave my money, so it's not a crime. Right off the bat, I mean, we're what? talking about confidence crimes. Confidence crime, by its very definition, is to gain the confidence and trust of somebody in order to get them to willingly hand over their money. So if willingly negated the crime, you could never have anyone arrested for a confidence crime. It makes no sense. But in their mind, there's a lot of ignorant people. In their mind, well, they know what a robbery is. Oh, if someone puts a gun to somebody's head, that's a robbery. They stole their money, you know. But they don't understand undue influence. That's my biggest hurdle, is getting police and prosecutors to understand the concept of theft that occurs due to undue influence. And by undue influence is what I'm saying is isolate the victim from friends and family, create a siege mentality, create a sense of dependency, exacerbate the fears. And it's much like a, a person will, um, a home caregiver who gets an elderly person to give money or write checks. And then the family finds out, wait, where's all this money going? Because the elderly person was being influenced by undue influence by the caregiver. Mm -hmm. The caregiver was in a position of authority. The caregiver created a sense of dependency and it was already built into the, the whole relationship, that sense mm -hmm. of dependency. The, the caregiver exacerbates the person's fears about not being able to do things on their own. The, the caregiver has the victim, the elderly person isolated and, and tells them don't talk to your family. So all of these same principles come into play with a psychic fraud victim. Mm -hmm. And the police and the prosecutors need to be more compassionate, more empathetic 
towards the victims and understand that the victims need help. And another thing is that the victims of financial crimes, it's often very devastating. They could be a victim and you could have someone go past someone on the street and knock them down and take their pocketbook. And that affects that person less than someone who was ripped off over eight years for a million dollars and psychologically decimated. So, you know, I'm not downplaying, you know, the, the, the violent crime, but what I'm saying is financial crimes need to be taken more seriously by law enforcement. And until that happens, the self-proclaimed psychics are going to continue to run circles around the victims and around the criminal justice system. They'll and push very as they can. They'll keep yeah, it. And very it. often they, they're met with uh, lenient sentences. And unless uh, prosecutors start to negotiate tougher plea deals or judges start to hand down tougher sentences, then you're never going to deter this crime from continuing because there's no deterrent if you're going to make $1.6 million and get sentenced to 40 months in prison. And of that 40 months, you're going to do less than three years. You made 1.6 and you're not going to pay back anything. You get a restitution order, just in, in a certain example, you, you know, you, and you don't pay the restitution order because you don't keep any assets in your name. So the self-proclaimed psychics don't keep any assets in their name. And the only time they really cough up the money is when at the time of sentencing in order to get a better plea deal and not have to go off and have members from the friends and family from the community chip in and pay the victims back. Mm -hmm. But if it's just a restitution order issued by a judge, they're never going to pay it for the most part. Right. And I, so I've heard you say the they're gaming, the self-proclaimed psychics are gaming the system and they're doing so because they understand the criminal justice system's propensity to deal with nonviolent crimes with leniency. Mm -hmm. I've heard you talk about how um, sometimes what they'll do is if they're caught, they'll offer money back to the, to the victim to make the charges go away. Correct. And the so and, and everybody's like, oh, good. You got your money back and let's not press charges. It's going to be a lot of trouble. And that just leaves the, the, the psychic to self-proclaimed psychic to go and do it again. Correct. The first case I ever had uh, against Gina Marie Marks, I got a call from the detective and he said, hey, Bob, I got great news. I got all the money back. I got 65,000. All that we have to do is arrange for your victims to, for a day for them to come down here and they can have all their money back. And I said, oh, that is great news. I said, when's she getting arrested? And he said, oh, well, no, I mean, I don't think you heard me. They're getting all their money back. And I said, no, I heard you. I don't think you heard me. When's she getting arrested? <laughs> I said, oh, well, well, the prosecutor's never going to go for that. You mean they're getting their money back? And I said, well, who's the prosecutor? And I said, oh, well, I don't want to throw anyone under the bus. I said, why is it throwing anyone under the bus? We're all good guys. We're all doing the right thing. If that's the case, it's not throwing anyone. What's the name of the prosecutor? Well, you didn't want to tell me. I called up the state attorney's office and I talked to the prosecutor and basically his attitude was these people are lucky they're getting back anything at all. Who are you to call us and tell us what to do? You know? And I said, well, you know what? You're right. You know what? As far as who am I to tell you what to do, but I'm looking for justice here. And that's why, you know, I have the right to tell you what I think should be done. And uh, he said, well, we have prosecutorial discretion. And that's when I said, yeah, no, you're right. You're absolutely right. You have prosecutorial discretion prosecutorial discretion. I said, I just hope that you're happy when you see your name in a paper, that you're comfortable exercising your prosecutorial discretion, <laughs> because in the next week or month or so, you're going to see an article in the paper, and it's going to say that I'm watching the wheels of justice fall off, and the psychic was able to get out of this by just paying off the victims, and that it's just revolving door justice. And, the, and he hung up the phone on me. And uh, with this, I had a guy that I knew by the name of Bob Norman who wrote an article about the situation. And he said, I was watching the wheels of justice fall off. And they ended up charging Gina Marie Marks. And <laughs> she ended up paying back the 65000 anyway. And she got convicted and pled guilty and convicted. So, and, and, you know, it was only because we laid that groundwork that the next time I got her and investigated her and got her arrested, that time now she did some prison time. She did 18 months. She paid back 503,000 and she did 18 months. But had I, had I just let it go through and said, oh yeah, okay, I'll get my people and arrange a day for them to come down here and get their 65,000. None of that happens. That's <laughs> so there's a lot of impediments to prosecution and there's a, lot of, uh, you, there's a lot of knowledge that you need to know 
in how to get around the tricks that occur. A lot of times the self-proclaimed psychic will have the victim sign a piece of paper saying, oh, like somewhere in the course of the scam as an exit strategy. They're thinking ahead. If I ever get in trouble, I'll have the person sign a piece of paper saying, oh, I willingly gave my money. This was all a gift to the self-proclaimed psychic, you know, to me, to the psychic. Right. And so I've had that happen where a prosecutor calls me, a detective calls me and, and they say, we're in Manhattan. And they say, oh, well, listen, we're going to be dropping this case. And I said, well, why are you dropping it? And they said, oh, because the, the victim, the defense attorney, signed, sent over a piece of paper that was signed by the victim saying it was all a gift. And I said, listen, don't you understand that that's part of the scam? I said, you know, if you're going to be duped by that, I don't know what to tell you. I said, you know, of, of, and on top of that, I said, a victim can't sign the states right away to prosecute somebody. Okay, the state is the one prosecuting it. The victim is the witness in the case. So there's a lot of things you got to know. And what we're dealing with is theft. Okay, right. it's not, to be honest with you, it's not about, for the most part, it's not about whether someone is psychic or not. Okay, and a lot of people don't like to hear that. Okay, because they say, well, you know, it's, it's all baloney. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, as you know, my job is I'm going in and I'm proving the lies that are told between the psychic and the person as far as the money being transferred and what is said in order to get that money, mm -hmm. okay? And I'm not really going after them, other than in New York where fortune telling is a crime, uh, per se is a crime. Uh, most of the time in a lot of states, what I'm doing is I'm proving theft. And I'm proving that the psychic, for example, says, hey, listen, you know, I need you to give me this money and then I'm gonna take it to my altar and I'm gonna pray over it. Money is the root of all evil. So we need to draw the evil away from you, but it's going to want to go to the money. So we'll use money to draw the evil away from you. Then I'm going to take the money to my church. I'm going to cleanse it and I'm going to give you the money back. So when they don't give the money back, that's a crime. They stole the person's money. And, uh, and for example, you know, with the Rose Marks case, the federal prosecutors had called me up and they said to me one time, they said, hey, Bob, listen, uh, you know, we got this case and, uh, you know, how are we ever going to prove basically whether this woman is psychic or not. And I said, oh, I'll pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. You're off in the wrong direction. I said, that's not what we're doing here. I said, we're proving, we're finding the provable lies and proving that. So they said, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, give me, let me give you an example. Say Bob is psychic. Let's right. just, for example, say Bob is a psychic. You know, get, and, and so they said, okay, all right, we'll make believe you're a psychic. And I said, and I say to Joe, hey, Joe, you're going to be in a terrible car accident next week. And the reason is, is because your car is possessed by evil spirits. So if you give me your car, what I'll do is I'll take it to my church, bring it to the parking lot, I'll pray over it, and then next Friday, meet me back here and I'll give you your car back. And then next Friday comes and Joe is nowhere to be found and the car is gone. I said, did Joe steal Bob's car? I mean, did Bob steal Joe's car? Yeah. And they said, well, yeah, of course. I said, does it matter if Bob is psychic or not? And they said, oh, wow. You know what? It doesn't really matter. And I said, welcome to the game. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, th there was a case where I did have it where, but, but very rarely, but I had one where the woman said she was psychic. And then at the end of the scam, she came clean and told the victim that she had lied and that she doesn't have any ability and that the whole thing, a seven-year scam, $1.6 wow. million dollars that she had lied and said her children were not, you know, her, she said that she had two children. They weren't really her children. They were her niece and nephew, something to that effect. Um, and she just came out and said, you know, I'm a liar. You know, I, I told you this whole thing as one big lie. But then she told us she wanted to write a book and about the whole culture that she grew up in and about how she was brought up in this culture and that, uh, you know, it was, it's evil ways. And she wants to, uh, you know, tell everybody about what's going on and it'll make a lot of money. And she says to the victim, well, you know what? We'll make a lot of money with the book. And then I could give you the money back that I stole from you from the proceeds of the book, you know? But you have to pay $30,000 for somewhere around there for a ghostwriter, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, it's just one story after the next. Oh, you know? God. Oh, my God. It keeps... So um, one of the things that you had said in the article to, to uh, Rob, Palmer, Rob Palmer was that a lot of these famous psychics, you know, the ones we see on TV are gateway. 
And um, I see Kevin Mocker here has said the same thing about getting Teresa Caputo arrested, which I don't think is going to happen. But but this idea that these people who are on stage that look real, they're priming the audience to be able to go to another psychic that's... Well, you know, it, it's a tough situation because depending on where you are and the interaction between the person and the psychic, it, it could be legal, it could be illegal. It depends on what state you're in, you know, what jurisdiction and what the law is in that jurisdiction and what type of interaction is going on between the two people. In a lot of states, you know, it's just, it's not illegal to hang up a sign and say you're a psychic and take money for pe from people that you have psychic ability. There's no crime committed there, mm -hmm. um, you know, but in New York state is a fortune telling statute. And so, you know, in Oklahoma, there's a fortune telling statute. You know, every every state has theft, though. Every state has false, you know, stealing money, theft by deception, theft by false pretenses, mm -hmm. theft by false promise. There's many ways that you could commit theft. And a lot of times the self-proclaimed psychics run afoul of the theft laws. But not every self-proclaimed psychic runs afoul of those laws. You know, you could have someone that just says they're a psychic. They're in a state where it's not illegal. And they say, it's going to be $500 to come see me. And I'm going to tell you a future. And there's no law that's been broken. Yet. Mm -hmm. But then again, you have, to, so you have to have somebody who will prosecute that. I mean, if there's these fortune telling laws in, in Oklahoma and New York City and the police are just like, well, we got better things to do. Well, that's where I come in. Because as an ex-cop, uh -huh. I go in with the victims and I say, hey, listen, you know what? When this person first came in, you told them it was a civil matter. But I know better because I did your job. I was a cop for 20 years, okay? And I've caused people to be arrested for this. So, and then all of a sudden it's a different story. And then we, sometimes we get into a fight over it. <laughs> and it becomes contentious. And, but push comes to shove. Uh, sometimes I say, well, you know what? I'll walk out the door and I'll go, get to, go talk to the media and I'll give this to the media and then we'll see how we make out, you know? It seems like that would be a really, that's, that's a lot of these avenues that you're exploring to get results are not traditional, you know, what we would have thought, you know, going to the media and, and, you know, the way you're explaining to the police how this it is often, a crime. Yeah, it, it often takes a monumental effort on my part to help these victims get the justice that they deserve. I mean, you know, I have to go in there and deal with some cop that's never made a fortune telling arrest, doesn't even know it's on the books, doesn't even know there's a law. I have to take out the penal law show them the penal law. I have to take articles and show them that I've caused people to be arrested, you know, for this in Florida or in New York, in California, all over the country. I'll say, well, how was it that this detective was able to make an arrest or well, this case was prosecuted in your jurisdiction, but you're telling me it's not a crime. Here's the newspaper article of the last time that I caused someone to be arrested. And I, I mean, but yet, if I'm dealing with a different cop or a different detective or a different prosecutor, I've got to go through that whole process all over again. Mm -hmm. Yes, so absolutely. It's very, it's very difficult. It, it is. But I'm wondering, um, one of the things you said it, um, in that article with Rob Palmer is you were saying that you belong to the Bunko Association and that they were thinking, they were hoping that maybe you would uh, do lectures to uh, that they could give to the, you know, police and, well, and to the prosecutors so people we could so because we can't clone you so <laughs> there's got to be some way of educating these people in mass yeah well the uh, uh, interesting story there is that i got kicked out of the bunko association oh no yeah i received a letter telling me that because i was critical of law enforcement that they couldn't have that or it's something to the effect of because of the fact that you've publicly made comments criticizing law enforcement, mm -hmm. you know, we're terminating your membership. Oh my so, goodness. So, so here oh I am working goodness. hard and, and you know, this is what happens. So and you wonder about, you, you wonder about that if it's changed now as people are getting more and more critical of the police. See, a lot of the you people in the organization, now. a lot of the people in the Bunko organization are uh, law enforcement. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I go up there and say that, hey, listen, I go in and, I'm, you know, my victims are being turned away. My people are being turned away and they're being told it's a civil matter and it's ridiculous. And then, you know, there's a certain amount of people that don't like that. You know, they don't want to hear that, you know. 
Yeah, so. absolutely. I would think that that would be something that's you're, you're on a thin fence line there. That kind yeah. of, and I wanted to mention also that, um, the, not always, but it seems like the majority of people who are being victimized, who are being taken advantage of are women. Is that what been in your experience the same? It's men and women, you know, it's just people, the commonality is they're going through a difficult time in their life, but there are more clients. And I'd say the average client would be a woman between say 27 and 35, who's looking to get married and is told that they're never going to get married and never have any kids because of this negativity or darkness or curse. Really? So, kind of I like, thought it would be know, older. No, nah, it's, it's in that age group. Yeah. Wow. When, I, when we go to psychic events and do anything to deal with psychics, it, it, it's almost all women. You see a few men there, but they're mostly with a woman who probably encouraged them to show up. Okay. I, I don't know what it is about that. I, I, you know, Mark and I get that question a lot. And I kind of wonder if women are just more comfortable sharing emotions and sharing with a, a stranger, you know, what's going on in their life and asking for advice. And whereas a man may not, I don't know. Yeah, I think you're right on. I think you're right on target on that. You know, I think women are more uh, open up to each other and to other people more so than, than a man will. I yeah. mean, not, not all cases, but you know, as a generality. Possibly. Well, it seems, it seems like that might be working. It said, um, let me look here at my notes. Uh, you guys, if you have questions, go ahead and ask them and I'll, I'll be happy to forward them over to um, to Bob here. So just be, <laughs> patient, uh, be patient with this. I think one of the things I really enjoy about listening to your work is that you're very sympathetic to these people who are victims. Um, that's something that we don't see always in the skeptic community is something that I practice and I preach. I get to know these people who are, who write to me and tell me how they were taken advantage of. And I think that we need to have a lot of sympathy for, for, for these people because it could be any of us, or it could be our mom. It could be our aunt. It could be, you know, somebody we love and care for. And just at a moment of time, this is, they're being taken advantage of these, these, these grief vampires, they know when to prey on somebody and they know that if they can't get the hook in them, then they'll move to somebody else. But, you know, we're all vulnerable. Yeah. You know, I was brought up by my parents from when I was a little kid to treat people the way you'd want to be treated. And, and when I was a cop, I looked at things when someone came in for a report, I'd say, what if that was my mother? What if that was my father? What if that was my brother? You know, when deciding whether to take a report or not and how to handle that person's case. You know, if you always look at something as, well, how would I treat a member of my own family that I love, mm -hmm. then you're not going to do wrong by a victim. But what you're hitting on is very important is that, you know, the victims are often they're emotionally abused, they're financially decimated. And it's just that as a victim of a financial crime, it's not looked at seriously a lot of times. And, you know, I just saw something the other day from the pandemic where a guy lost his um, bar, he, you know, because of the pandemic, he wasn't able to keep the bar going. And his mother was on TV and he was in his 20s, a young man in his late 20s. And the mother was saying that the, he, the son committed suicide because he lost his bar. So, you know, the financial devastation of losing that bar played an integral role, I would think, in his, you know, committing suicide. Now, I find a lot of the people that call me up are suicidal. Okay. I've had people call me up suicidal. I had a woman call me up one day and she says, Bob, uh, you know, can you help me? I said, well, what's, she says, I live in Queens, New York. She says, and I, my husband and I, we don't have much, but I've saved up. We've saved up our whole lives and we saved up $90,000 to be able to send our daughter to college. And then within a couple of months, I gave it all to a psychic. I got duped. And she says, I don't know what to do. And she was so emotional on the phone. She was very emotional. And I said, well, you know, I'm pretty good at helping people get their money back. I'll help you build a case. I said, you know, let me, you know, we'll talk, uh, you know, come and see me and we'll put a case together. And she says, you don't understand, Bob, you don't understand. And I said, no, I, I kind of do, you know, I do this for a living. I've been doing it for yeah. 10 years straight. I says, you know, I was a cop before that. She says, Bob, you, you just don't understand, do you? And I said, no, well, she goes, how would I ever go home and face them? She said, I, I said, well, that's what we'll talk about. You know, come on in and I will do the best I can to help you. She says, Bob, I'm going to be honest with you. She goes, I'm on my lunch break right now. She goes, I'm standing on the eighth floor. And as I'm talking to you, I'm on the ledge. And I'm thinking I should just take that one step 
and end it all because I don't know how I'm oh going to go. And I had to talk her off the ledge. So when a person walks into a police station, and they say, hey, I was ripped off for $90,000 or $50,000 or $1,000. It doesn't matter. That money means a lot to that person. And you have to be empathetic. And you don't know that person's condition, their situation. Mm -hmm. And when you sell them, oh, it's a civil matter, and laugh at them, misreporting ignorance, laugh, and you show them the door, you know, you're doing a great disservice. You don't know what could happen to that person. Mm -hmm. You don't know the state of mind that they're in, you know? So uh, that really, um, it fuels me, makes me work harder to try to get the message out there and try to fight to get justice. You know, like like the Bunko Association we were talking, they could kick me out of, of all they want, but the thing is, is that I'm never gonna stop being critical of those who don't do their job, and I'm never gonna stop trying to change things to help victims. I'm never gonna throw a victim under the bus to get along with a detective in a precinct or not make the cops look bad. You know, listen, I respect the profession because I was a cop, but the last thing I'm ever going to do is take a client or a victim and throw them under a bus to have a good relationship. And so everything is, you know, hunky dory with the police. That's not happening. You know, I fight for my clients and I think they deserve justice. And I know they deserve justice, you know, and, uh, and I'm not going to be deterred from that. And and we're we're very proud to uh, <laughs> to know that. We just like I say, we want we want to clone you because uh, <laughs> it, there's so much work to be done. Uh, okay, so Rob says to make sure to ask you about the fascinating case with Priscilla Kelly Demar Demaro. Oh, Priscilla Kelly Demaro was a case that I had. Well, I had her in Florida, and. Uh, she had uh, been convicted that, well, she went to court. She ended up paying the victim some money back. Mm -hmm. And then uh, a few years later, I came across her in New York and she had ripped off a, a young British guy and uh, it was something like $550,000 and she got convicted on that case. And uh, the interesting of that is she had told, during the course of the case, she had told the uh, guy he was going to get him together with his significant other, a woman that he wanted to be with. And uh, he said, oh, you know, can you do it? She said, oh, yeah, I can get you two together. And then at one point, the man went on Facebook and he saw that the woman he wanted to be with had passed away of a drug overdose. And she was, she was gone. I believe it was a drug overdose. So he went back to the psychic and he said, oh, listen, you know, um, what do you, you know, you told me a bunch of nonsense. I can't get together with her. She died. She's gone. And she says, oh, nothing has to be unless you want it to be, something to that effect. And she proceeds to dupe him into believing that she can reincarnate the woman in another young woman's body, and then he'll be together with her. And he continued to give her money and thought that she could really do this. So, I mean, when you're, you know, when people are desperate, you can pretty much get away with anything sometimes. You can almost get them to believe anything when they want something so badly. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a gambling fallacy, isn't it? Mind, a story comes to mind. Mm -hmm. I met a young woman one time out in New York City, and uh, we were talking, and she told me that she was a exotic dancer in a strip club. And I said, oh, you know, whatever. And, and I said something about her parents, the parents. She says, oh, they don't know. She said, they almost found out one time. And I said, well, what do you mean? And she says, well, my best friend told my parents that the two of us were both dancing at the same club and her parents told my parents. So I looked at her and I said, well, then your parents know. And she says, you, you a cop? She goes, how could you be so stupid? And I said, well, what do you mean? She goes, I can't believe you. You're actually a cop. I said, yeah. She goes, she goes, unbelievable. And I said, well, enlighten me because I don't, I don't think I understand. If your parents found out from her parents that you, she goes, listen, when my parents confronted me, she says, I cried my eyes out. I go, and I told them, oh, she's lying, they're lying. I says, and they believe that? She goes, oh boy, she goes, are you kidding me? You're really a cop? And I said, what? She goes, don't you know that it's easiest to lie to those who love you the most? Because mm -hmm. they want to believe you so bad. And that was the moral of the story. <laughs> it's easiest to lie to those who love you the most because they want to believe you so bad. 
So the self-proclaimed psychics have people that come in there and they want to believe them so bad that they're willing to suspend their critical thinking and give any amount of money to have their dreams come true. And the self-proclaimed psychic is more than happy to sell them on that. And it's, and it's, it's just such a terrible thing for one human being to look at another human being in the eye and lie to them and tell them that they could, you know, fulfill their dreams when in fact they have no power or ability to do that. I just find it reprehensible. Absolutely reprehensible. And that's what I was saying is it's in, in a way, it's also the gambler's fallacy where you've already invested so much money into this whatever that you feel like if I just give them a little bit more, you know, let me just give them a little bit more and maybe yeah. it'll it'll turn out where I get, you know, my money back or, or yeah, something. I've helped the feds with some cases and I've helped them do expert reports. And, I, and one of the things that comes up is the sunk cost fallacy as one of the hallmarks of a scam where uh, there's a progression of fees. That's another hallmark. They, you don't just start someone off at $60,000 or $90,000. You say, hey, I need $50 for a reading. Then I need a couple of hundred dollars for some crystals and candles. And then, oh, I found out upon doing deeper research, the root cause of the problem is this curse. But that is something that's been on you since your whole life and you're 30 years old. So I need a thousand dollars for each year of your age because we got to go back. I got to go all the way back in time to correct this problem from when you were born. So we need thirty thousand dollars. And then it just goes on and on from there. But it doesn't start with the thirty thousand no, no. dollar reading or a five dollar reading, you know. And then so you have this progression of fees as one of the hallmarks. And then once the person has put more and more money in, there's the sunk cost fallacy where they've sunk enough money in where they start to think, well, the psychic told me I was getting everything back. And if I offend them, maybe they're not going to give me back what they promised me or to already give me back. So I don't want to offend them. So if I keep going along, hopefully they'll keep their promise to me and then I'll get everything that's coming to me the way they said it was supposed to come to me. All my dreams will come true and I'll get my money back. But, you know, this is part of the scam. Wow. Absolutely crazy. And, you know, I'm glad that you pointed out about the money, too, because we see these big, big scams, you know, where you collect, a, you know, 65,000, 80,000, one point something million dollars. But, you know, just somebody who's losing five hundred dollars or even a fifty dollars or whatever it is to them, that could be you know, between them and having their gas turned off, you know, or, or not being able to buy their medication this month or I mean, it money is relative um absolutely money's relative and it affects people in different ways and you know i've had students college students call me up say bob i'm out a couple thousand that's money that was supposed to go towards my tuition or towards my books you know mm -hmm. and uh that money means a lot to them they're, they're crying on the phone to me you know and then i've had other people call me up and I had a college professor call me up he was out three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. you know he was out west and he said to me hey bob uh you know, I have this uh, psychic that ripped me off and I want to see, you know, he'll talk to you a little while. And I said, OK, you know, you want to see what this is all about. And I said, yeah. And I started to talk to him. I said, I'll build a case. And he said, no, 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 Bob. Didn't you hear me? He said, you don't understand. He goes, are you listening to me? <laughs> and I said, well, no, I'm listening to you. I said, you're out 350,000. You're ripped off by a psychic. I said, I can help you and we'll help you get the money back. He goes, Bob, I I'm surprised that you, you know, like I said, well, 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 what am I missing? You know, just like the girl. I'm like, what am I missing? He goes, Bob, I'm a college professor. He goes, I could never bring a case. If this case, my name ever came out, he goes, I'd never be able to walk back on that campus. He goes, I'd never be able to go before the faculty or the students again. He goes, as a college professor, my reputation will be ruined that I was scammed by a woman who has less than a fifth grade education. And I said, well, that's not the point. The point is anybody could be duped while at a vulnerable time in their life. Doesn't matter if you're a lawyer, a doctor, a college professor. You got to put that aside, you know. And I give the people that come forward a lot of credit because they face a lot of embarrassment and a lot of shame, and they come forward anyway in spite of that. And I really admire them for doing that because it's not easy to come forward and admit that you were con. And um, and so in this particular case with the, the college professor, he just said, Bob, I just called you to talk to you. I just want to pick your brain and talk to you about how it all works, but I'm never going to bring a case. And I was amazed. He just walked away from 350000 So that's another thing that the self-proclaimed psychics have in their favor is they know there's a lot of embarrassment or shame. 
And a lot of times, a majority of times, for every one person that comes forward, there's probably 50 people that don't, at least. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, another thing is when people go to see these self-proclaimed psychics, they often open up to them and tell them everything. They tell them all their deepest, darkest, darkest secrets, okay? And so I've had people call me and tell me all kinds of things like, Bob, I told the psychic that I cheated on my husband. I told the psychic, you know, about my sexual orientation. I told the psychic about, you know, this or that. And, you know, if I go and bring a case, can she now bring that up? So what the psychic will often do is elicit someone's innermost feelings and desires and all kinds of things and elicit that and then use that as part of their exit strategy. Remember when you told me this X, Y, Z? Well, you ever go to the police against me, that's coming out. So I've never had it happen where something came out because usually once they get in trouble, they don't want to mess with that because it doesn't help them at all. It only shows how evil they are to do that and then come out. So I've never had anybody exposed like that, that told somebody something. But that fear that it could happen though is, is you know, something that preys upon people's minds. And they probably don't report it. I hadn't even thought of that angle before, but you're absolutely right. Once you get start getting into a con, your con, it's a confidence game and you're feeling very confident talking to this person. You think it's this anonymous situation going on where it's just you and them and now you're opening up, not realizing that what you're telling them, they might someday use as emotional extortion against you and that could come back to haunt you. And they pull that out of you on purpose. Exactly. They elicit it and they egg you on and get you to talk about it. Remember you told me this? Remember you told me that? I can't tell. I mean, you know, I can't tell you how many people call me and say, hey, Bob, I'm worried, though, if, if we do this, you know, I said this or I said that, you know. So you call it, you're out conning the con. How, what is it you actually do? Like, let's say somebody calls you up and says, hey, Bob, I was scammed for this amount of money and this, and they used one of these, you know, like switches or, you know, they blessed my money and then they didn't give it back or, or what is it? How, you say you're going to build a case, but what is it you actually do? What kinds of things? I'd start off with an interview with a victim. Mm -hmm. And I say, what was going on in your life prior to you ever meeting the psychic? Mm -hmm. What was it that was going that caused you to walk in that door that day? You know, mm -hmm. and I usually find out it was either, you know, something with love or money or health. And then after, you know, eliciting from them, I start to say, okay, well, you gave money on this occasion. What were you told this money was going towards? Mm -hmm. Okay. What was the money for? What was supposed to happen? Were you supposed to get the money back or not? And I go through each interaction and I look at all the different times money is given and under what circumstances. And then I show whether it was under false pretenses, whether it was by false promise, whether it was by larceny, by trick. Uh, if, just as a simple example of making a case. I had a guy, young guy out in California. He was ripped off and he told us, the psychic told him that she needed money to buy crystals and candles, but he didn't have all the money. So she said, well, you know what? You can uh, get me gift cards. You will go and open up a credit card and then you'll have credit on that credit card. You'll be able to take out gift cards on the credit from the credit card you opened up, see? So you'll, get, you'll open up a credit card and then you'll use that to get $500 gift cards. Then you give me the gift cards and then I'm gonna buy crystals and candles in order to do the work that needs to be done to pray and, and, and remove the spirits, the evil spirits. So what I did is I backtracked and I found the gift cards and what they were used for. And they weren't used for crystals and candles. They were used for a kid's birthday party at Chuck E. Cheese. They were used for women's clothing, you know? So, so there you have two people, you have a victim and a psychic, the person, the victim goes in and the psychic says, I need these $500 gift cards so that you can, I can, you know, buy crystals and candles from the Holy land that are very expensive. And then I'm going to work with those crystals and candles. Meanwhile, I can show that the gift cards weren't used to purchase crystals and candles, you know, something like that, you know? Wow. <laughs> oh my gosh. You know, there's many different ways, you know, like another time I could be following the psychic, okay? And I'm doing surveillance of the psychic as the scam is going on and the psychic is texting the victim, oh, I'm at St. Patrick's Cathedral right now 
doing the work. You know, I'm, I'm battling with the spirits. I'm praying. And meanwhile, I'm watching them and they're in Atlantic City pulling a slot machine. You know what I'm saying? They're not, they're, they're not at St. Patrick's Cathedral. I'm just using that as an example. Yeah, yeah. You know, That's a good example. But they're at Empire Casino in New York and they're pulling a slot machine. You know, or they're at some party, you know, they're at a club or at a, eating at a restaurant and they're not at the church. So right there, that's a provable lie. So you're looking for, you know, over the course of a relationship between a victim and a self-proclaimed psychic, there's many interactions and you got to pick out the interactions where you can show provable lies. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The, um, um, I was told to ask you uh, about Umawa, Uma Witch. You want a witch? Yeah, there you go. That's, you said it. I, I did. Well, common last name. Uh, I've had a case against Sherry Uwanowicz recently, which it was a $1.6 million case. And, um, and it was a big case. And she got sentenced to 40 months. But, uh, you know, I, I looked at the final disposition of that case. And, I, and it disgusted me, to be honest with you, because Sherry Uwanowicz was sentenced to 40 months, but she took over $1.6 million. So, and she's going to do less than three years. So, you know, three years into one, you know, that's one, what is it? 500,000 a year, right? It's 1.5. Mm -hmm. So she made more than 500,000 a year was the cost of doing business basically. So if I took an ad out in the paper and I said, I'll give anybody $1.6 million if you'll go to prison for 36 months, there'd be a line of people around the block looking right. to take that deal. You're right. Right. So so you're never going to stop this crime if prosecutors don't start negotiating tougher plea deals or judges start down handing down harsher sentences. Mm -hmm. And if you look at, say, in that case, this case is wire fraud and a person could get up to 20 years on wire fraud. But they say, oh, well, we have to go by the federal sentencing guidelines and that falls. And you have to look at a whole there's a way that they look at it. Has the person have any past record? And there's a whole bunch of factors that go in where they come up with a number to figure out what the person, the guidelines are. But the guidelines for these financial crimes are so low that, you know, it's now no deterrent mm -hmm. to the self-proclaimed psychics who are committing the crimes. It's just the cost of doing business to them. So I don't know what the criminal justice system is really accomplishing when doing a restitution order that isn't worth the paper it's written on because the victim's never going to collect because the psychic doesn't have anything in their name. The whole key is you got to get the self-proclaimed psychic to hand back the money at the time of sentencing in as part of a plea deal that keeps them from going to prison for a long period of time. In other words, if the psychic is told you're going to go to prison for 10 years, you see how quick they come up with the money to pay back in a lump sum at the time of sentencing so that they don't have to go to prison. You follow? Mm -hmm. So until the prosecutors get smarter or I don't even know what to say. I mean, they have to get more wise to the fact of how the game works, you know, and what the incentive is and what the impediments are, you know, and they have to handle the cases, you know, accordingly so that there's a deterrent. Is that I'll, I'll never be out of business the way it's currently going, you know, with the sentences that, that, that are being handed down for these financial crimes with the weak, in my opinion, weak sentences that are being handed down with the worthless restitution orders. Um, you know, I've helped people get back millions of dollars because there are a lot of good detectives and there are a lot of good prosecutors that I have dealt with mm -hmm. that, you know, have negotiated good plea deals. So I have a, a, a you know, a track record where I can look to other police officers and detectives and prosecutors and say, hey, look at the way this detective did it. Look at the way this prosecutor did it. They made the victim whole. They got full restitution. Plus they got some jail time for the psychic. Mm -hmm. Or if they couldn't get the restitution, they at least put the psychic away for a long amount of period of time and gave a stiff sentence. So there are examples, lots of examples that I can point to but every time I do a new case and I'm dealing with a new prosecutor or a detective, I got to try to educate them as to the ins and outs. And the self-proclaimed psychics, they have the best lawyers money can buy a lot of times. 
and they're using the money they stole from the victims to pay off the lawyers a lot of times, you know, or money they stole from other victims. And so, you know, money is no object a lot of times to have good, good defense attorneys. They often have the best, you know, defense attorneys money can buy. And they have, you know, they're at their beck and call. They, as soon as they get in trouble, they go to, they call up their go-to guy and he's already on the phone with the detective seeing if he can like pay half the amount back and, you know, if he can work out a deal. If he can't work out a deal with the detective and an arrest ha actually happens, which is rare, then the arrest happens and now it goes to court and then he calls up the prosecutor and tries to work out a deal with them, you know? Well, isn't it better that the victims get some money back than see my client go to jail, you know? And sometimes the prosecutor will completely drop the charges in return for the money coming back. The detective sometimes won't even make an arrest. If he does make an arrest, sometimes the prosecutor will totally drop the charges. And then other times all they have to do is pay back what they took. And if you look at it, the full restitution that they're paying back is the money they took from the victim. It's not even their own money. And they're using the money they took from the victim to negotiate the plea deal, to gab leverage. That's what gives them the leverage. So, you know, it sounds very depressing. <laughs> but it's not I am depressed. I've been very successful and there's a way to get it done right. And there's a way to make victims whole, get them full restitution. And a lot of times put the psychic in prison. And what you want to do in any prosecution is you want to balance the needs of the victim and making the victim whole with the needs of society and protecting society. So that's, that's the goal. And it can be achieved. <laughs> that's amazing all right so we're at an hour i, I told you that time went yeah time flew flies like crazy yeah. so um maybe you should give us some uh how we can get a hold of you if we want to learn more about you any yeah. media watching you right now that will be like because yeah. i think media would really help more and more media right. it's a way of getting your story out and how to fight back and and please to take it more seriously and blah 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 I think that's really helpful. Yeah, all they have to do is just Google my name, Bob Nygaard, you know, N-Y-G-A-A-R-D. And I have, you know, I come up with the Wikipedia that you people so graciously did for me. And that was, that that has, you know, uh, been such a, a, a good thing because people read that all over the world. I mean, I have people call me from Ireland. The guy called me from Ireland the other day and he read the Wikipedia page, you know. Oh, is that right? Yeah. And and so, you know, it's uh, it's really been helpful to me. And so, People need, and that is Rob Palmer wrote a very informative Wikipedia page. So when people go on there, they can really learn a lot. He did such a great job on that page that a lot of the information that people want to know, the initial questions they have are already kind of answered just in that page alone, you know? It's like a one stop shop, you know? Yeah. Kind of a, and yeah, then they Rob, can go to the links at the bottom if they want to get more information. Yeah. So, yeah. And there's links on there, you know, to so many. Uh, Rob put so many links on to mm -hmm. so many articles that is just, you know, a wealth of information. And you Google my name and it just comes right up as one, like the first uh, one. Of the first yeah. Page link you know so that is the number one way and then on twitter and uh, you know my email is bob nygaard at gmail.com and my phone number is there and so it's really easy to get a hold of me you know and your last name is spelled n-y-g-a-a-r-d ways right right so make sure you guys take note of that so this has really been fun i have had a blast talking to you i'm so glad i was able to to get a chance to talk to you chase you down i know you're really really so busy i thank you so much for inviting me because, uh, you know, all the help that you give me has aided me greatly in trying to achieve my mission. You know, both you and Rob and Derek, the whole skeptical community um, has just been wonderful in helping me get my message out. And, and you know, you're going to be doing a talk for Cyclon, I think. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm really excited about that. I wanted to go and to oh, Vegas and do no. it in person. And it was the first time I was invited by Barry. Barry invited me. and. Um, but uh, I'm going to do something online, you know, make the yeah. best. And we'll see you in 2021 in Vegas. We're going to do a uh, psych on in 2021. So mm -hmm. you're going to do a talk for psych for CSI here soon. Hopefully one uh, of us, I know I'm doing a talk for him too. All the people who are supposed to speak at 2020 are doing a talk. And then we'll also uh, have you back in psych on in 2021. Cool. The person have a fun time there. That'll be a blast. I can't wait to have for that yeah. again. It'll be nice when we can get out of our zip code. 
Right. <laughs> I'm not going exactly. anywhere. Yeah, and I'm going to do something for Dragon Con online too with Derek. Oh, you know? wonderful! Yeah, so I mean, you know, everybody's making it work. You know. Yeah, it, it's it's been it's you know if there were psychics out there, I would think that they would already have known about uh, Zoom and probably have been invested in the Zoom and all <laughs> the technology. But for some reason, they didn't seem to invest in it. I did a I did an article not so long ago on I went to all the websites for all the main psychics that I knew of and I just looked at their websites and they they all canceled like events mm -hmm. that they had planned for the time of this covid and my point of the article was why would you plan if you're supposed to be psychic how did you not know we were having covid and and if you knew we were having covid why would you plan events that you're now having to cancel you know and you know trips to tours they were supposed to go on and things it's like it's so obvious to me but we can't assume that everybody <laughs> understands that you know yeah i hear you it's a shame all right bob so i will talk to you again soon i will talk i will get this video uploaded onto youtube very soon a friend of ours a uh, part of the gsw project is going to take it and format and make the video better quality and the sound better quality. So it'll be on YouTube in about two or three days. In the meantime, people can watch this over and over again on Facebook Live, which is another great invention, I think. Great, I look forward to it. All right, Bob, thanks so much yeah, for your time. Take care of yourself. Bye.